I'm happy to say that the father of cytology lived over 400 years ago. That was Robert Hooke using this extremely primitive microscope. Thankfully, we don't have to use these to look at cells in slices of cork. The father of pathology comes along almost 200 years later, that is Rudolf Virchow from Germany. And he was very famous because he propounded the cell theory. In those days, there was a lot of controversy and uh, the scientists used to fight a lot about whether cell theory or germ theory is the cause of disease. Now, this gentleman was a very um, uh, uh, aggressive person. In fact, he even challenged Bismarck to a duel. Instead of pistols or knives, Rudolf Virchow said, we will both eat sausages. We'll enjoy our meal, but one of the sausages will have trichinella spiralis. Whoever catches the trichinella will die and the survivor is the winner. Of course, Bismarck did not agree with this, but you can understand how much of controversy and uh, debate was there between this. Germ theory ultimately won and cell theory became relegated to pathologists in our studies because the importance of cholera epidemic, Robert Koch and tuberculosis took everything towards microbiology. But as pathologists, we have looked at the simplistic cell injury model, that is the hypoxia model for over a hundred years now. And the diagram is so simple. We just have this, this is the cell, the oxygen is coming. If we cut this, what happens inside the cell? That has been the model of cell injury, which we have studied. If you look at a cell culture, you can see here, this is a cell in culture, which when injured loses its microvilli, but instead acquires cytoplasmic blebs because the cell is swollen up. If you look at the normal cell, these endoplasmic reticulum become swollen because of the retention of fluid. And in this normal cell, the rough endoplasmic reticulum as well as the polysomes are aggregated, which become disaggregated in injured cell. This is what we have been studying for the last 50 years. The most important of the cell organelles which can get uh, injured are the mitochondria. So this mitochondria, uh, you can understand that all mitochondria have to come from pre-existing mitochondria only. The nucleus cannot create new mitochondria. And therefore, when the last mitochondrium of a cell is destroyed, the cell has to die. It cannot be reversible. So the pre-existing mitochondria, uh, the telltale sign of the massive damage is the amorphous densities, which can be seen in mitochondria. The other concept which we have very well understood for the last 50 years is free radical injury. Free radicals we know have unpaired electrons, which are unstable, and these are the oxidizers. So they oxidize whatever they touch and they're autocatalytic. That means more free radicals are produced at the end of the injury. The injury is therefore during a propagation reaction. So a typical example of this is peroxidation of lipid membrane. So in lipid peroxidation, there is an initiation where a superoxide cuts the double bond of a PUFA in a cell membrane. So the unsaturated double bond gets cut and the PUFA becomes a free radical with a free electron in it. This is now free to attack other double bonds of the PUFA. So all the double bonds start getting cut and cross-linked like this. So PUFA, PUFA cross-linkage converts what was a lipid bilayer into a uh, onion skin-like uh, appearance, which is what we call as the telltale signs of free radical injury. It stops only when you have a termination, which is by or other antioxidant stop the free radicals from propagating. Exactly similar to these myelin figures, cross-linking of proteins also occurs when these sulfhydryl groups of proteins are attacked by the free radical disulfide bonds. So the proteins are all the damage is produced by single and double strand breaks as well as cross-linking. Now there is a type of new cell injury called ferroptosis, which is which is a non-enzymic free radical injury. I won't go into details of that because we need to go farther. If you look at this, this is what happens in a free radical injury. The CCL4 forms CCL3 and cuts all the double bonds. The double bond is where this leg of this is bent. That gets cut and it gets cross-linked and it forms these myelin figures, 
which is the sign of free radical wherever free radicals are generated whether it is in peroxisome you have the antioxidant in cell membrane that lipid peroxidation you have vitamin e if it is the mitochondrion then free uh, electron transport for that vitamin c e, vitamin e and beta thiamine peroxide if there is a lysosome against that we have vitamin c and beta carotene so like that these three radicals are always linked this was the understanding of cell injury when around 50 years ago we found that there is another form of cell death which is called apoptosis it was discovered in this tiny nematode worm which is found in the soil called cyanorhabditis elegans or c elegans it has around 1000 cells only of which exactly 131 cells die at a particular precise point by programmed cell death in contrast the human body every day 10 to the power 9 that means 1 billion cells undergo apoptosis every day forming up uh, undergoing the program we all know how to recognize apoptosis because we are all pathologists they are the small shrunken bodies with pycnotic nuclei if you give dexamethasone to a mouse in the thymus this is a normal thymus and after dexamethasone it has all become apoptotic these are the histiocytes eating this here the electron microscope shows the normal lymphocyte and the condensed nuclei and the cytoplasmic blebs with condensation unlike cell injury the insides of these blebs have condensation not swelling here also you can see a cytoplasmic bleb over here in this apoptotic this is a cytoplasmic organelle packed bleb here the nuclei have become pycnotic and taken up by the macrophage another thing which can happen in cells which have a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum is formation of these ribosomal aggregates like this they all aggregate together in contrast with the ribosomal disaggregation which is seen in cell injury here we are we can see a kidney tubule in which an apoptotic cell is there and how the nuclear features the nuclear chromatin becomes clumped at the rim like this although we knew about apoptosis for the last uh, 50 odd years in the last 20 years a lot of research has gone into identifying and utilizing this apoptosis and central to this is the identification of the substrates for caspase 3 first of all the earliest way of detecting uh, apoptosis used to be the tunnel or tdt nick and labeling tdt uh, labels all nicks which are present in the dna now we can do other kinds of stains like we can stain for caspase 3 even a cell which has not started to undergo apoptosis can be found this is a cardiac myocyte full of caspase 3 so caspase 3 creates other interesting changes for example it can activate this phospholipid flipases and phospholipid scramblases which invert the cell membrane and phosphatidylserine annexin cal reticulin molecules which are normally present on the cytosolic side or in rough endoplasmic reticulum come outside and we can detect it also we can either do a confocal microscope to detect it like shown here or we can do flow cytometry to detect it an important thing to understand about apoptosis is that it's an atp dependent process there is another way of cell death which is parp which i'll come to in a short while this parp also requires atp so one of the functions of the caspase 3 is to inactivate the parp based or the parthenotos pathway other interesting thing include uh, activation of fodrin which cross links all the cytoskeletal proteins activates gelsolin which causes actin depolymerization so all the cell uh microvilli and other cytoplasmic projections uh, are lost they decrease the cellular adhesion by inactivating the adhesion kinases and the nuclear and scaffold proteins are also affected by cleavage of lamin which causes the nuclear shrinkage and fragmentation now i have created this extremely busy and complicated slide to explain apoptosis in one slide so obviously i have to explain it this square box which is outside this is the cell this round over here is the nucleus this round over here is a mitochondrion and 
these are the uh, various things which can get activated in various pathways so whatever is external to the cell like tnf alpha or fast ligand they cause the extrinsic pathway to get activated where the initiator caspase 8 is activated so it could be also activated by cytotoxic t cells which poke a hole in the membrane with perforin and inject granzyme b into the cytoplasm this causes direct death by activating the executor caspases, which the downstream of which I've already explained. But the more important part of it is integrated in the nucleus and the mitochondrion. This integration is because of pro and anti death signals like growth factor or injurious agent. So if the growth factor is not there, then Bax is activated, which causes permeabilization of the mitochondrion. And if the growth factor is there, then BCL2 protects it. Similarly, if there is an injurious agent, it can activate the P53 pathway, which causes a cell cycle arrest. But if the cell arrest does not repair the DNA, BACS is released, which causes permeabilization of the mitochondrion. Subsequent to this, a large complex called the apotosome gets formed, which is right at the center. This apotosome is a molecular motor, which causes generation of large amounts of initiator caspase 9. PD-1 also affects this if this ha cell happens to be a T cell. So binding of PD-1 and PDL one causes release of these SHP and SHP2, which uh, promote the uh, Bax gene if it wants to kill the cell or it inhibits the proliferation by negatively influencing the uh, MAP kinase. In the last 20 years, however, programmed cell death has been discovered in a lot of other organisms. The evolutionary biologists have found it in plants and yeast where we previously thought apoptosis does not happen. Here, the central area is the mitochondrial permeability transition pore. So the mitochondrion is the key. There are no caspases. There is cytochrome C release and calcium influx in mitochondria. There is stresses like reactive oxygen species and they have divided it into different types, apoptosis-like, autophagy-like, necrosis-like, depending on the speed with which these program cell deaths occur. The new concept which has now come up, which is what I wanted to mainly address in the lecture is oncosis. So oncosis is now thought of as a switching mechanism between necrosis and apoptosis. Necrosis and apoptosis are no longer considered as two opposite ends of a pathway, but that there is in fact an integration which is happening in between. Central to this is understanding of ER stress. ER stress means that whenever there is reactive oxygen species or damage to the cell, there is protein misfolding due to the oxidative damage, and this produces ER stress. If there is mild ER stress, then the survival effectors like chaperones, which are the part of the UPR, which I'll just come to, they get activated and the cell survives. But if there is severe ER stress, then there is hyperactivation and the death effectors get activated. Therefore, the previous concept that the oncosis is a reversible and then an irreversible cell death now is thought of as a way station. From here, it can either go into necrosis or it can go into apoptosis or other types of cell death. This, uh, the word is derived from onco's meaning swelling and it's a pre-lethal pathway. The main characteristic of this pre-lethal pathway is the leakage of damage assistant, uh, associated molecular patterns and the presence of inflammation unlike apoptosis. Any sudden shock to cell, infection by rotavirus and other pathogens, cell death of course in ischemic injury, they are all examples of this and in both oncosis and apoptosis can be linked by the energy requirement of apoptosis. A cell undergoing apoptosis can exhaust the ATP supply and unable to complete apoptosis, it can undergo secondary necrosis. Similarly, if oncosis is inhibited, cellular stress can induce apoptosis in a cell also. So this hypothesis of oncosis that apoptosis and necrosis are not distinct mechanism, but opposite extremes is the main uh, advance which we have seen over the last few years. And opening of the mitochondrial transition pore is observed in both of these mechanisms. So instead of calling it as apoptosis and necrosis, we now call it as accidental cell death 
which is a rapid uncontrolled cell death morphological manifestation is necrosis greek is death it's a major pathway in injuries due to ischemia toxins infections and trauma it's the inevitable end result of severe damage beyond salvage it is not regulated by genes any specific signals are lacking and biochemical pathways are not there happened happens accidentally when the stress is beyond the limits and cellular constituents may simply fail or fall apart regulated cell death on the other hand includes apoptosis necroptosis pyroptosis etc many are there can occur in the absence of any exogenous environmental disturbance also but they can also occur in their presence they utilize a built in effector and for development or tissue turnover these are normal things which are sometimes utilized for cell death elimination of useless or potentially dangerous cells like an infection or tumor is one of its functions and the varied inflammatory and histiocytic responses can depend uh, can be there depending on the type of cell death so in 2018 uh, the committee there's a nomenclature committee also for this on cell death met and came up with this long list of you know as many hours are there in a clock so many types of cell death they have described it's not important to go into each of these just important to remember that regulated cell death can have either an apoptotic morphology or a necrotic morphology so if something is very complex i like to explain it but uh, again the diagram i made to explain the newer concepts in cell injury is a very complicated diagram so let me explain it this is the bo this box is again the cell this is outside the cell membrane this is the nucleus the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria which are the central actors in this various cell signals which can be death signals or injury signals or atp loss all of these converge on a cell to cause changes in the cell membrane and a signal transduction or a membrane uh, dysfunction these can activate by an integration process the two main integrators are the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum the mitochondrial membrane can be stabilized or destabilized and if it becomes destabilized beyond a point then it releases a cytochrome c which causes formation of this molecular motor called apoptosome which starts off apoptosis this is an atp dependent process another atp dependent process is because of nuclear injury it doesn't involve the cytoplasm at all it is a process called parthenotos where when there is nuclear damage an atp dependent cell death occurs what er stress and um other kinds of injuries agent can do like uh, pathogen associated molecular pathways is either the necrosome or inflammasome activation if the necrosome is activated it causes a necroptosis if the inflammasome is activated it causes a pyroptosis these are molecular motors very similar to the apoptosome in contrast to apoptosis and parthenotos where nothing happens outside the cell after it is triggered necroptosis and pyroptosis release both dams that is damage associated molecular patterns as well as interleukins and cell signaling molecules which cause inflammation and necrosis beyond that cell so apoptosis is within the cell necroptosis and pyroptosis go beyond the cell to injure the tissue and the entire organism these complex molecular motors are illustrated here the apoptosome inflammasome the necrosome and another one called the proteasome whose function is to degrade all the proteins so the important thing here is the er stress what is er stress er stress means oxidative damage to the proteins the proteins get injured whenever a protein uh, gets injured it has a tendency to misfold this misfolding causes problems and therefore proteins called chaperones which include the heat shock proteins come and bind to these proteins to protect them stress proteins are rescued by this mechanism and the function of the protein is retrieved after the misfolding is refolded but if the protein is irreversibly damaged another protein called ubiquitin binds to it and marks it for later proteasomal degradation so here you can see this is the protein heat shock protein if a protein is misfolded then it binds to the chaperone this 
some chaperones are called hold aces. They just hold it in position for other things to come and act. These others are the ones which cause a repair of these misfolded proteins. So when it binds to this, this is a misfolded proteins. Other proteins like GRO, ES7 will come and they will bind to this area and refold it. So essentially this is an ATP requiring process, energy dependent, unfolding and refolding. So the protein is unfolded, ejected through one area and refolded. The protein has a tendency to automatically reassemble into its uh, original folding if the misfolding is unfolded. So the hold aces and the unfold aces are the essential components of this chaperone mediated uh, retrieval of uh, misfolded proteins. If these proteins uh, cannot be so uh, unfolded, then ubiquitin binds to it and degrades it in the proteasome complex. Misfolded proteins are a pathognomonic feature of so many things in pathology, whether it's Russell bodies, Mallory dunk bodies, Kuru plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, Lewy bodies, Huntington's inclusion, all of these are representing misfolded proteins. Now, ER stress is very directly linked to apoptosis. One good illustration for this is to understand how Cal reticulin functions. Cal reticulin is one of the chaperones. It is not just a chaperone, it is also a calcium binding protein and it is present in the ER. Whenever the oxygen mediated damage is there in the endoplasmic reticulum, there is increased expression of cal reticulin, which is expressed in the endoplasmic reticulum. But if the damage becomes too much, then there is a relocalization of the cal reticulin. It goes from the endoplasmic reticulum to the cell membrane. And once it goes to the cell membrane, it now acts as a phagocyte marker for uh, taking up of the apoptosis. It also triggers apoptosis because of the ER stress and activation of the uh, other pathways of um, apoptosis. Let's look at another way of cell death, which is pyroptosis. So pyros means fire. You call it pyroptosis because the cells look like they're flaming out. One cell is just flamed out. Inflammation has happened in just one cell. The other reason why it is called pyro is because pyrexia, they produce fever. What happens in pyroptosis? This can be thought of as programmed cell death with collateral damage and inflammation. It is seen in macrophages and epithelia infected with salmonella and shigella. These are caspase dependent, but not the same caspase as apoptosis. Instead, this is a caspase one. So caspase dependent, but pro-inflammatory cytokines are also released. What happens is that not like receptors, that is NLRC4 or tall like receptors, recognize PAMs present in microbes. These activate the NL not like receptors to assemble the inflammasome. The inflammasome is made up of this NLRP3, which has this card or the caspase activation domain, whose function is to cleave pro-caspase to caspase one. Caspase 1 does two things. It releases interleukin 1, which causes inflammation and fever. And it uh, releases this gas dermin D. This goes to the cell membrane and pokes holes in it, forming pores. Therefore, if there are pores in the cell membrane, the cell is going to swell up and die. So there is flow of ions, swelling and lysis of the cells and release of further dams. So the damage associated molecular patterns cause further inflammation because of this. But the nuclear integrity is maintained unlike apoptosis. There is no fragmentation. The caspases are different. The second type is another necrotic morphology type of uh, regulated cell death, which is necrotic uh, necroptosis. Here, there are the triggers for the necroptosis are almost same as for apoptosis, like reactive oxygen species, DNA damage, metabolic imbalances, or because of activation of dead domains, pattern recognition receptors, tall-like receptors, DNA binding protein, ZDNA, ZBP1, all of these which cause apoptosis can cause necrosis when caspase 8 is inhibited. So an apoptotic signal, if it finds that the caspase 8 is inhibited, can cause necroptosis. <clears throat> 
what happens in necroptosis is there is sequential activation of proteins which assemble to form this necrosome. So there is this RIPK3 to which this MLKL will come and bind and this forms a ripoptosome. This MLKL like uh, gas dermin can form pores in the cell membrane and kill the cell. So this ripoptosome is like a rheostat between apoptosis versus necroptosis depending on whether caspase 8 is available or blocked. Some infections like CMV can actually have caspase 8 inhibitor to escape from the cells lysing and the virus getting lysed along with it. Here they have illustration of the same. This is apoptosis when caspase 8 is activated. If this is not possible, this is the alternative pathway where the MLKL assembles to form this necroptosis and the ripoptosome. Now we come to yet another form of cell injury and cell death, which is called Parthenotos. So Thanatos is the Greek god of death. So hypnos, if, we, if you touch somebody, the Greek god of hypnos, if he touches somebody, he will fall asleep. And if the Greek god Thanos touches somebody, that person will die. And that is the derivation for the Marvel super universe villain called Thanos. You can remember it like that. So it is par Thanatos. And the reason why it is called so is because this is a cell death pathway activated by this PARP1. PARP1 is poly-ADP ribose polymerase, a nuclear enzyme, which senses mild DNA damage and causes repair machinery to get activated. But if there is profound DNA damage, it causes a PARP1 mediated cell death. This is because the PAR polymer accumulates and causes translocation of AIF protein from mitochondria to the nucleus. This causes large scale DNA fragmentation and cell death. So nuclear condensation and fragmentation is present, but no cytoplasmic change is produced. This is an ATP dependent process and is extremely important in stroke, neurodegenerative disease, spinal cord injury, and a lot of research is going into this. This is just an illustration of parthenotos where active PAR releases the PAR polymer, which causes relocation of the MIF and AIF back to the nucleus to produce DNA fragmentation. Let's come to some examples and study some diseases where these kind of ER stress are now being evaluated. Diabetes is a very important example. In diabetes, the beta cells are lost in type 1 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, you have resistance to insulin. And now we are discovering that ER stress is at the uh, base of both of these processes. What happens? When there is ER stress, there is nuclear gene upregulation, which was discovered way back 30 years ago by the UPR in yeasts. And we have just discussed how chaperons are mediated for the protein unfolding to be cured. Apoptosis is triggered if these fail. When there is ER to nucleus signal transduction abnormality, you start getting diabetes. So if there is abnormal expression of ATF, PERC, IRE, these are various uh, signal transduction methods between the endoplasmic reticulum and the nucleus. So mutations in these in raw dense can produce experimental diabetes. Similar mutations in rare human analogs have also been described like abnormal nuclear translocation of CHOP. Sometimes you get misfolded insulin. Sometimes you get it in obesity. All of this, the end result is that apoptosis of beta cells is triggered. So there is an injury which is because of this oxidative stress and ER stress. The autoimmune process which we stress for generation of type 1 diabetes is mediated through the oxidative and ER stress. And the importance of this is if you can block the pathway, you can prevent beta cell damage and destruction and preserve some of the beta cells for uh, continuing to produce insulin and a lot of drugs are being tried in this respect. On the other hand, we have lipotoxicity and glucotoxicity. That means when the blood levels of lipids and glucose go up, it causes a stress response in all the tissues of the body, all over, everywhere. So glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity are responsible for so many of the changes which we see in the from the eye to the kidney to the heart. It is all related to 
स्ट्रेस रिलेटेड सेल इंजरी ई आर स्ट्रेस एंड सो नाउ दैट वी आर वर्किंग आउट सम ऑफ दीज वी आर ट्राइंग इनिबिटर्स टू ईच ऑफ दी पाथवेज to see which one will have an effect for example you have now er stress modulators one example an experimental molecule mo molecule called azoramide what it does is that it reduces the bias ipm mein bolts and bias it can also protect tissues from hyperglycemia hyperlipidemia and it can prevent this diabetic cardiomyopathy also so that yeah. means that these drugs not yeah. only keep the beta cells active yeah. they reduce the damage which is present in diabetes also so in the short term the upr activation aids in restoring the protein production and folding balance but if there is chronic er stress then there is apoptosis and autophagy getting triggered we have not discussed autophagy i will cover it in just one slide important is that the er stress is what causes the cell damage in a pleiotropic fashion in um, diabetes so what is autophagy autophagy is a titrary regulated set of genes called the atg which include genes like becklin lamp and rap7 these are upregulated during any cellular stress like chronic er stress whenever there is deprivation of nutrients where deprivation of growth factor these atg genes are the balance is changed the end result is recycling of organelles extensive cytoplasmic vacillation phagocyte uptake lysosomal degradation of the organelles so that the constituents are released for the cell to reutilize for its uh, own purposes is there an autophagic cell death probably not because this is a mechanism which is always activated when there is cell injury and if injury beyond the limit causes death your atg genes will always be active but now we have slowly discovered in plants definitely there is autophagy mediated cell death and slowly we are realizing that neurodegenerative di disorders also autophagy mediated cell death is important especially stroke which is a very common disease similarly there is great potential in chemotherapy inducing autophagic processes can help us target neoplasia let's come to another example that is gout we have all seen this is an aspirate from a gout and this got these crystals there is a giant cell reaction to the crystal which you can see occasional histiocytes you can see some neutrophils you can see if we polarize it with cross polars you can see so beautifully needle like crystals are birefringent because there is deposition of monosodium urate we always thought that it was a simple disease that uh, when there is gout there is hyperuricemia and the uric crystals get deposited and cause inflammation but it turns out that there is very complex pathway involved in pathogenesis of this disease so if anybody has gout what happens is if he drinks too much or eats a lot of meat you get a reaction that is there's a flare amplification and then resolution so for a week or so his toe becomes swollen and is extremely painful and after some time it goes away on its own or with anti inflammatory drugs what happens here is that this flare initiation starts because monosodium urate is actually a damp or a damage associated molecular pattern which is recognized by toll like receptors as well as by endophagocytosis or lysosome formation which activates the inflammasome activation once inflammasome is activated there is lot of interleukin 1 release which potentiates the inflammation so once the flare starts then there is a problem then there is amplification all the nf kappa b activation causes release of all these mediators including interleukin 6 tnf alpha interleukin 1 beta all these get released and it so turns out that if you use a monoclonal antibody against this interleukin 1 it can cut the flare initiation at its induction itself so by understanding this molecular mechanism we find a way to cure it how does it terminate on its own subsequently the anti inflammatory molecules like tgf beta starts getting released then cytokine inducible sh2 suppressor another inflammatory mediator which inhibits inflammation then suppressor of cytokine melanocortins acth release of these mediators causes the inflammation to go down 
Interestingly, the reason why we get a gouty tophus is when there is a chronic foreign body granuloma formation, which is initiated by another form of cell death called netosis or neutrophil extracellular trap induced cell death. When netosis is activated by the monosodium urate crystals, this net forms a network of the nuclear contents of the neutrophil, which traps the cytokines and slowly degrades them. And so when you look at this, you can find that there are a lot of histiocytes which are there in between the crystals. We can find a lot of inflammatory cells which are here, neutrophils. And these are all because of the inflammasome associated disease pathways. The last thing I would like to talk about is viroporins. Uh, not a lot of us might have heard about this because the microbiologists are the ones who mostly talk about these. What are viroporins? These are viral proteins which modify cell membranes. Their aim is to permeabilize them so that the cell uh, entry is gained by the virus or release of the virus is uh, mediated or the endoplasmic reticulum is modified for creating lots of virions by RNA viruses. A good example of it in a DNA virus is HPV E5 oncoprotein, but I'd like to talk about SARS-CoV-2, which has two viroporins called E protein and 3A protein. So this is the cell. Here we have the cell. Here we have the endoplasmic reticulum. And here we have the nucleus. What has happened is that the virus has come, attaches to the converting enzyme 2, gets internalized. And then it releases the viroporin, which is the 3A, for example. If it is 3A, it goes and permeabilizes the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, which is its main function. But it has a second function. It activates the NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B goes into the nucleus and releases a lot of interleukin-1 in the form of pro-interleukin-1. And this 3A viroporin also activates the pro-caspase-1 to caspase 1, that is the inflammasome pathway to create lots of interleukin 1, which creates the cell injury because as you know, caspase can uh, activate gas dermin and poke holes in the cell membrane and it causes inflammation. So the inflammatory storm which is created in SARS-CoV-2 is because of this inflammasome activation. So necroptosis, if you look at it, is also activated. Therefore, when the SARS-CoV-2 comes, it can either cause apoptosis of the cell or if the apoptosis is inhibited in any way, then it starts releasing a lot of this P17 and the MLKL, which causes necroptosis, which also causes the death of the cell which is infected as well as inflammation. So the activation of NLRP3 by the NF-kappa-B pathway causes the inflammasome activation procaspase 1, which potentiates the cell death and the inflammation which acts. What is the importance of this? We have used drugs, all these drugs which we have tried out, many of them you might recognize, including something like uh, even um, hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine inhibits the lysosomal fusion. Uh, uh, IL-6 inhibitor like tassili, uh, tocilizumab is because it blocks the interleukin-6 release, which is over here. So the interleukin-6 is blocked by this monoclonal antibody. Almost all of these drugs have been tried either in cell cultures or in animal models or in even human trials to see whether we are able to cut the inflammation. So by understanding the inflammatory processes which have recently been described, we are able to target new diseases also and old diseases also. So to summarize, the cell injury pathways are now known to link the cell membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, and the nuclei. And each of the topics which I have talked about today is actually a topic for a full-fledged lecture because there is so much detail which is known. There is signal transduction in both these directions. And all of these pathways are targets for drug development. The very active research, as I said, there are innumerable number of monoclonal antibodies and inhibited drugs which are being tried all the time in cell cultures. They are important for inflammatory diseases like viral infections, typhoid, I've not touched on typhoid also, gout, arthritis. These are all very good examples of how we 
uh, target the new cell injury pathways which we have described they are also very important cell loss mechanism they are cell deaths so beta cell loss in diabetes cell neurons loss in neurodegenerative diseases all of these are mediated by the kind of newer cell injury mechanisms and cell death mechanisms which have been discovered in the last 10 years or so these are the references which i have used uh, the the other references were referred to in the slides themselves and i would like to end this talk with an acknowledgement that i borrowed a couple of slides from my colleague dr aruna nambi rajan and a couple of slides which i showed were uh, from presentations by our residents hina and kristabella thank you all very much for your patient listening